This morning we're continuing, if you've been with us at all, in the month of June, a series we've been in called Family and All the Things. And in this series, we are talking about just that, God's purpose and intention, His plan for our families, for our relationships, for our children, for our marriages. And if there's anything I think the enemy has attacked more uh, in our day and age, in our culture, it is the fabric of family. The enemy wants nothing more than to tear apart, to confuse, to break down, to shred, to dismantle family. Uh, but I believe that God actually has a purpose, a plan, an intention for our families. I've heard it said, if you can change a family, then you can change the world. You see, when God wired all of us, wired humanity, the way that we all intersect, every culture and every language on every continent, he wired us with an innate need and he planted us in families. He put us both in our families of origin and he also welcomes us into his family the family of God. And this month, we are doing our best to take back the family altar and to remind ourselves of God's passionate intention and purpose around our families. And I can't think of a more vital role in a family than that of a father. And this morning on Father's Day, I want to take a little bit of time to talk about this. And well, I'd love to share with you my 20 points on fatherhood from my 20 years of experience. The truth is I don't have that uh, message preached and really lived quite yet. So I'm going to save my hot tips on fatherhood for another day. Although I will let you know when you change the um, baby's diaper, you always need more wipes than you think. Um, you can jot that one down. Um, but what I do want to talk about is, is just the role of God as our father. You see, I don't know where you're at. I don't know what your background looks like. I don't know what your upbringing uh, experience was. I don't know what your relationship with your dad was like. But whether you are a dad, whether you never had a dad, or you're longing to become a dad, what I do know is that all of us, each one of us, those watching online, those in the room, we were all created with an inner desire, kind of a primal longing for a father's blessing. We were wired and created to need the love, affirmation, and affection of a dad. And I have good news this morning. No matter what your upbringing looked like, we have a God in heaven who has given us his Father's blessing. And if I can do one thing this morning on Father's Day, it's to remind you of his love, his pride in you. I want to look at, if you have your Bibles, Matthew chapter 3. So kind of be the main text we'll look at today and break down a little bit. But I think this is such a great passage of Scripture it's the moment that Jesus is water baptized, and in this moment, we see quite a profound interaction between God the Father and his son, Jesus. It says this in Matthew 3, reading in verse 16, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. These 13 simple words would change the course of Jesus' life. I believe these 13 simple words can change the course of our life. And I believe these 13 simple words can change the course of our kids' lives. I want to take some time this morning to talk about a message I've entitled, A Father's Blessing. A Father's Blessing. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you. And God, today as we gather on Father's Day, Lord, I know so many experiencing so many different emotions on a day like today, but I am so grateful that no matter what life has looked like in our homes, that you are our Heavenly Father and that you love us and you care for us more deeply than we could ever comprehend. I ask you today, Lord, as we open your word, that you would use it to speak to us. I pray you would transform us from the inside out. Help us to see you clearer and, Lord, more closely. And may we leave today, all of us, from our time together, walk and talk and live in a whole lot more like Jesus. We love you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone who agreed said, amen. amen. Well, today I am celebrating my third Father's Day as a dad. And uh, it's pretty exciting for me. Um, I absolutely love being a dad. I don't think there's been a greater experience, a greater job I've ever been given in this world than to be the dad of our little girl named Olive. Olive's just over two and a half years old, and we have one more 
on the way in October. Being a dad, I, nobody prepared me for it. In fact, I, I don't know if there's something I've felt less prepared for in my life than when our child was born. God, what do I do with this thing? <laughs> I didn't think about this, but my wife, Alexa, when she was a young girl, teenager, a young adult, she had lots of experience with babies, babysitting, changing diapers, taking care of kids of all ages. But to be honest, in my life, I didn't. And so when this baby came, I didn't watch tutorial videos on changing diapers. I didn't know sleep schedules. I thought, yeah, great, they're babies. I guess they'll kind of like, we'll figure it out as we go. I was so unprepared. Deeply unprepared. Did any other dads feel this way when their child came onto the planet? I remember holding this baby in the hospital saying, God, I, I, how, do I, how, do I, how do I do this? He said, just one step at a time. So I learned how to sleep train. We learned babies don't sleep. Learned how to change diapers. Learned that no matter how many times you say shh in their ear, they don't care. They will keep screaming. I don't know how many nights between 2 to 4 a.m. I'm rocking the baby shh doesn't work. Don't trust the videos. I don't know how many times my own character was tested in the newborn stage with Olive. I have many embarrassing stories from being a, a young dad dealing with my own selfishness and anger, <laughs> desire to sleep. I'm going to save those stories for another day. I don't know anything else I was more unprepared for in my life, but it's been an amazing journey because there's so much you learn. You're reminded of who you are, reminded of God, how God wired you, reminded of God's love for your kids. And every day, every day since Olive's been born, there's been lessons, lessons to learn about who I am, about how to love her well, about how to help her to see the love of God. And I had an interesting story happen recently. I was with Olive this past week, and we were out on our back deck, which some of you know the story of the back deck. I have a praise report, ladies and gentlemen. It is almost done. Um, so thank you. Yeah, you can celebrate. I don't know when it's going to be, but it's getting close. It's getting close. But this past week was with our daughter, Olive, and uh, we kind of rebuilt some stairs on the back side of the deck. And Olive was doing something I'd never seen her do. It was amazing. She was going up to the stairs, and usually it's like parent nightmare number one. When a child is by stairs, you run after them and grab them. But she was a little bit far away from me, and I couldn't get to her in time. And she was standing on the edge of the stair, and she jumped down to the next one. My heart sank. But she landed it. It was awesome. It was the first time I'd ever seen her do it. I was like, oh, shocked. And she did it again and again. And she got to the bottom step, landed on the grass, and she turned around to me and she went, ta-da. <laughs> Where does she learn these things? I'm telling you, there are little wins in the life of a dad, but man, that was the coolest moment ever this week. I ran down, I grabbed her, I picked her up, I threw her in the air. I was like, all of you did it. And the light on her face, oh, she just lit up and she put her down, she quickly ran back and she did it again. Except this time, rather than focusing on the step, as she jumped, she would stop and she would look at me. I said, Olive, good job, good job. And then she would stop and she would jump and she would look at me good job, good job, jumped and looked at me, good job, good job. She got to the bottom and again, ta-da. And we did this over and over and over <laughs> and over and over and don't let her see these stairs in the sanctuary, please. But it was a beautiful moment. And I thought it was interesting because I'm watching her and obviously like it's just a cool moment as a dad and you guys are like, that is like the cheesiest thing, but it was awesome. As I'm watching her do this, I was just so touched and like moved, right? By her every step looking, looking to me. Here's what I noticed. I had this kind of moment as we did this time and time again is, is Olive was looking to me not so that I could see her do something cool. She wanted me to see her do something cool, but she already knew that I saw her the first time. She kept looking to me. Why? Because she wanted to see me see her do something cool. Did you catch that? Olive didn't just want to be seen doing something cool. Olive wanted to see her father's reaction, the joy, the pleasure, 
the proudness of her dad's reaction when she did something cool. As I'm watching this moment just this week, standing on our back deck, I like welled up with tears because I was reminded of all my own journey and I think all of our own journey and this innate desire on the inside of us as kids. All of us, we crave, we long for, we were wired with a desire for a father's blessing. We want, we crave, God wired us to look back at our father and look for his eyes of approval, affirmation, love and pride. And I think the reality is, is that while that's very true for Olive, and while that's probably true for all of our children, I think if we were honest, all of us, even as adults, we still innately crave and desire that same feeling. We were created for a father's blessing. God's wired us to want and desire a father's blessing. And I think, unfortunately, in the world we live, in the homes many of us grow up in, so many of us are longing for that but never finding it. I think this brings me back to this passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 3, right? You see, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he's now 30 years old. He's unknown by anybody else in the world of his real identity, maybe besides his mother and father, Mary and Joseph. And Jesus knows it's time to now be launched into the thing he's been preparing for for 30 years, to step into this, this ministry season where He's going to preach amazing messages, and he's going to do mighty miracles, and he's going to raise the dead, and he's going to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, and he's ultimately going to go to a cross, and he's going to die to be resurrected, to open up the door for new life for all of humanity, and he's right at the beginning of this season of his life, this stage of his life, and he goes to be water baptized, a very practical act, but also deeply prophetic of what his very life and ministry was meant to do. He starts in baptism on day one, and on the end of the three-year journey, he goes down into the grave and rises again resurrected. And in this moment, in this powerful prophetic moment, nobody else around knew how important this situation was, but there was someone who did, his father. And Jesus goes into the water, he comes out of the water, and the voice of the heavenly Father, it resounds so all creation can hear. And he says this simple phrase, this is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Thirteen simple words. Long before Jesus did any miracles, long before he earned it, long before he worked for it, long before he looked or did impressive things, before he raised the dead, healed the sick, taught the multitudes, went to the cross, his heavenly father gave him a gift, a gift of words, a gift of a blessing that would impact the life of Christ in a profound way. Thirteen words spoken from heaven. Thirteen words that I think still preach today. Thirteen words that made the ministry of Jesus possible. Thirteen words of a father's blessing. And I think, like I said, all of us in some way or another, we ache for the blessing of a father. I was fortunate in my own upbringing, as I shared with you, to have a dad who knew how important this was. A dad who gave me his blessing and time and time again has reaffirmed his blessing in my life, an extension of God through him to me. But I think many, many maybe even in this room deal with wounds from the absence of a father's blessing. Some have experienced the profound healing that comes from its presence. We've seen in culture and people we know and friends and in family the positive or the negative impacts of a blessing. And it's always in times of great crisis or great times of great triumph that this primal desire, it resurfaces itself. Here's the thing. I said it, but let me say it again. All of us have been wired for a need for blessing. We see this all the way in creation. Do you remember the story when God, our Father, he created humanity? It says this in Genesis 1, 27 through 28. It says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Listen, then God blessed them. He blessed them. He blessed 
us when God created us. He created us for a need for blessing, and then he gave us his blessing. His deepest desire for you and for me is that we would know, we would experience, and we would enjoy the blessing of our heavenly Father, of being reunited with our creator in Christ. God wants us to live from, not for, the strength of our heavenly Father's blessing. Yet unfortunately, I think so many of us, so, so, so many of us, some even in good homes and in challenging homes and in all different types of upbringings, I, I, I think we can, we can struggle with this. Our own human experience can make us feel so bogged down by shame or the hunger for approval or to be seen as good enough, this struggle to know what it means to live with the Father's blessing. And I think even more so for dads and myself as a young dad can feel intimidated of how do I transfer the Father's blessing to my kids? I find it interesting what John Tyson has said about this idea of a Father's blessing. He said, most of us move through life in an unblessed state. Rarely have we been valued, recognized, affirmed, and loved to the degree that our hearts need to thrive. We are left wondering if we're really enough, if we have what it takes, if our shame will ever be removed, our accomplishments ever noticed. Worse than that, many of us have been wounded and rejected, a curse in our heart and the place blessing belongs. Church, I don't know about you, but I think we all long for a blessing. And in just a moment, I want you to hear today afresh the blessing of your heavenly father that has been declared over you. If blessing is so important, then it might be good to understand what it is. What exactly does it mean to give someone a blessing? Is it something we say when someone sneezes? You're like, I do that all the time. This blessing, yeah, I got that covered. Bless you, good sir. Is it a hashtag? Hashtag blessed. Is it a vacation in Cabo? What does it mean to bless someone? Well, I like how Dallas Willard describes a blessing. He says, a blessing is the projection of good into the life of another. It's a simple definition for us. A blessing is the projection of good into the life of another. I think this is what God the Father was doing in the life of his son. The Father was projecting the good of heaven into the life of his incarnate son before Jesus did anything. He had the assurance of who he was, how he was doing, and how his father felt about him. And because of this, listen, I want you to catch this. Jesus could then embark and go into his calling, living from blessing and not for it. And I think in this whole concept of blessing, this is where a lot of us can see the damages. Often we live our lives pursuing to find blessing, living for blessing, trying to do enough to be noticed, approved of, loved, championed, make people happy with us. But God wants you to know today that you don't have to live for blessing. You can actually live from his blessing. Here's the deal. If Jesus needed a father's blessing to accomplish his mission and calling, then I think we need a revelation of it as well. And for the dads in the room, can I encourage you? So do our kids. I know as fathers, as dads, I think we all ache to bless our kids. But for many of us, it's hard to know exactly how to do that. <laughs> how do we extend the blessing of our Heavenly Father, both make it personal for us and then transfer it to our children in a TikTok, Fortnite, and AI world? Well, this morning, with our short time remaining, I do want to talk about that a little bit. Because I think Matthew chapter 3 and this blessing of God the Father to his son Jesus, I think it actually gives us a pretty good roadmap for blessing. These 13 simple words, they help us to understand and I believe we'll see revealed how God has blessed us, what our Father in heaven thinks about us. And I also think it will give us a good roadmap on Father's Day of how us as dads, as moms, as parents can bless our kids. You see, these 13 words change the life of Jesus these 13 words can change our lives and our kids' lives as well. So let's dive into it. Sound good? You guys with me? You guys with me on this side of the room? Oh, thank you. All right, here we go. Number one, first thing I think we can learn from Matthew chapter 3. First, the Father says these words, this is my son. This is my son. This speaks of the Father's acceptance. It's an amazing thing, church, that we have a God who calls us his own. Our heavenly father, our creator, he's picked us. 
He's chosen us. He's adopted us. He's accepted us in the beloved. 1 John chapter 3, 1 through 2 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 says, Even before he, our heavenly Father, made the world, God loved us. And listen, he chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. 2 Corinthians 6, 18, God says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I think sometimes it can be a message that goes in one ear and out the other that God has actually chosen us. He's picked us. Like on recess, when you're picking teams for a sport and everyone lines up against the fence and everyone's dreaded moment was being the last kid picked, God said, no, no, I see all. My wife's pointing at herself. (laughs) That's why I love you. God looked at us. And he said, you right there, I choose you. He picked us. He wants us. He's made us his kids. He loves us. We are chosen and accepted by him. You see, this idea of a father's acceptance, I think it's harder for us to kind of calculate nowadays. But the readers in the original kind of first century when the Bible was being written and these words are being established, it would have made a lot of sense to them. Because you see, in ancient Roman culture, There was kind of this ceremonial ritual that would happen when a mother would have a newborn child. You see, when the mom would have a newborn child, she would bring that newborn back to the father. Bring it home, back to the father. And there would be a ceremony that would take place. It's a different time and different cultural rules. But the father had a choice. He could either accept the child the mother has brought back to him, or he could choose to reject it. If the father chose to reject the child in ancient Rome in this cultural kind of ceremony, the father would literally look at the child and then he would turn his back away from the child and he would walk in the other direction. This was a sign the father was rejecting that child, didn't want that child, was unwilling to raise and bring that child into its home. But listen, if the father chose to accept that child, he would grab the newborn in his arms, he would cuddle the child, and then lift the child high into the air. And when he did that, he was signifying and he was telling not only the mother who brought the child home, but all those family members around him that he was going to take responsibility for this young child. In fact, here's what he was saying. He was saying, I want you, child. I want you in my life. I take responsibility for you. I'm going to bring you into my home. I'm going to do everything that I can help you to grow and mature and become the best person you can be. I am now your father. You are my child. I accept you and I choose you. You see, when God says he accepts us, this is exactly what he has done. God has not turned his back on us. He has not said you are unworthy of my love or of my commitment or of my embrace. God has actually said, I will grab you. I will lift you high above sin, shame, and condemnation. I choose you. I want you. I pick you. I desire to be close to you. You can come to me as you are because I accept you. I think often it's this issue of acceptance that so many people can lose their way. So often, because there was an acceptance at some point in our past, so many people spend the majority of their life trying to find it. People will change and morph to the group they are in, acting in totally different ways just to be accepted. People will change careers, change their clothes, buy cars, live in houses, go on certain vacations to try to find acceptance. People are craving acceptance. And I just want you to know a simple thought this morning that I hope the choir can just say amen to is that your father in heaven, he has accepted you. He's accepted you. You don't need to strive for acceptance. You have nothing to prove. 
just as you are. Your Father in heaven, he looks at you and he calls you his son and his daughter. He accepts you and he embraces you. He's picked you and he wants you. You don't have to fight in, you don't have to fight to fit in because in Christ you are enough. He accepts you, but listen, he loves you too much to leave you there. Your Father in heaven accepts you as you are, and then it'll take you on a journey to change you and help you to become more like him. Romans 15, 7 says, therefore, accept each other. Listen, just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. That's good news this morning. Can I encourage the dads in the room? How can we bless our kids? I think one way is just by extending the acceptance of God to our children. I don't mean we have to accept bad behavior or ungodly lifestyles. I think that's far from what God does with us, but I do think we can learn to be intentional, to see our kids for who they are, not just who we want them to be, to see them with their passions, their skill sets, their musical desires, their entertainment, whatever things they like to do that may be different than ours. Maybe they like to watch anime. I don't know. I still think anime is really weird, but it seems to be a trend, and maybe your kids are doing that, and maybe if you're like me, you're a dad, you're like, I don't know how to relate to you, dude. Anime is strange. This is like such a tangent for a second. I think we can just learn to accept our kids. I think your acceptance will go a long way from them having to live their whole life trying to get their friend's acceptance. I think of us as dads, and I'm not preaching to you, I don't know, I'm gonna figure this out when Olive gets older, but I just think maybe if our kids could find freedom and safety in their father's acceptance, they wouldn't go down this crazy path in the world striving to make their friends accept them because they know who already has accepted them. I think that's how God's treated us, and I think we can treat our kids that same way. Number two, the second kind of middle part of what God the Father says to his son. He says, this is my son, listen, whom I love. I think this reveals the Father's affection. I think it's amazing how all throughout Scripture, God is so intentional to reveal and to display his affection and his love for us. Bear with me. Let's look at a few passages of Scripture. Psalm 136 says, give thanks to the God of heaven because his love endures forever. Isaiah 54 says, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. John 3, 16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 8 says that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, nor any height, nor any depth, nor anything in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. First John 3 says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. First John 4.10 says, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Our Father in heaven has blessed us by making it clear that he loves us. He has not been shy about communicating his affection for his kids. He's lavished us with his love. Our heavenly father is not the proverbial dad who never says I love you, but only shows it by working hard away from home all week to provide for his family and hoping his kids can pick up on it. He works hard, he's blessed us, he's done so much for us, and he tells us it over and over and over again. Our father loves us. Here's what I find interesting about when God said this to Jesus. I mentioned it before it. A bit of a brain shift for me, though, because he said to Jesus, you're my son whom I love. Listen, before Jesus did anything to deserve that love, you're like, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. You see, God's love for Jesus, it was not connected to his performance. And I think we can recognize that, but I want you to know that God's love for us is also not connected to our performance. 
And I think if we're honest, if I'm honest with you, I think often this is where I've tripped up because so often I can go back to this pre-programmed way of believing that it's my performance, my works, my deeds that determine the amount God will love me. I scale God's love. When I have a good week, then I feel close to God and I know he really loves me. When I've done a lot of good deeds, I've served, I've read the Bible, I've been a good person, I didn't cut that guy off, then I feel close to God, I feel that he loves me. And then when I have a bad week, is anybody else human like me? I can all of a sudden start thinking, no, well, God's probably a little disappointed. I know he loves me because like the Bible says that, and so I go like, I get it, he'll never not love me, but the scale. See, that's what God didn't tell us in the scriptures. Actually, there's a whole scaling system he has. And his love, it's contingent on my ability to perform well. Not even according to what he's told me to do, but according to my own pre-programmed thoughts of what I think makes a good person. And if I can check all those boxes, hit all those little notes, then I'll really be loved by God close to him and I'll experience the fullness of his love. But when I'm just not quite perfect, that love, it scales all the way down. Can I just encourage you today? That is not how God's love works. God's love for you is not based on your performance. It is based on Jesus' performance. And because Jesus was perfect, because Jesus took our place, because the Father loves Jesus, his love for us is consistent, not based on what we do, but on what Jesus did. And as my mom has preached for a long, long time, can I just remind you again, it is not that we loved God. It's that he loved us. Our great calling is to live in and from the love of God, not for it. Your Father in heaven loves you. I found this quote, and I thought it spoke well to my own journey in this topic. It says, for most of my life, this philosopher writes, I have struggled to find God, to know God, to love God. I have tried hard to follow the guidelines of the spiritual life, pray always, work for others, read the scriptures, and to avoid the many temptations to dissipate myself. I have failed many times, but I always try again, and even when I got close to despair. But now I wonder whether I have sufficiently realized that during all this time, God has actually been trying to find me, to know me, and to love me. The question is not, how am I to find God? But listen, how am I to let myself be found by him? The question is not, how am I to know God? but how am I to let myself be known by God? And finally, the question is not, how am I to love God? But how am I to let myself be loved by God? God is looking into the distance for me, trying to find me and longing to bring me home. That is a perspective shift, I think, for a lot of us that we can never grow tired in navigating. Learning to not get so cocky in our own performance to make ourselves feel loved, but just to sink into God's deep, everlasting, and eternal love and to move and have our being from that place. For the dads in the room, if I can, I think one of the greatest gifts we can give to our kids is the gift of our affection. I know my dad was brilliant at this. Not perfect, but he was intentional. My dad's a big guy. He's 6'6". You're fighting weight 240, let's say. (laughs) My dad's a man's man. He's strong, he's tough, doesn't take crap from anybody. But at the same time, at the same time, my dad's a loving guy. And my whole life, my dad was intentional with his words, with his touch, and with his time to show me his love. And I'm so grateful for that. And I just want to encourage the dads in the room. Our Heavenly Father has loved us with a love that is unchanging, never failing. I just want to challenge you to love your kids that way too. I know all of us in the room, that's our passion. That's our desire. So be encouraged. Let's look like our Heavenly Father as we love our kids. Amen? All right, finally, number three, and keys can come out. We'll wrap up with this. I think the last thing we learned from this passage in Matthew 3, the father says, this is my son whom I love. And the last thing, with him, I am well pleased. I think this displays the father's affirmation. The father's affirmation. I don't know if there's anything a child desires more from their father than simply his affirmation. Dad, how am I doing? Do you approve of me? Are you proud of me? Dad, what do you think of me? I think questions like these are not only on the minds of our kids, but 
also live deeply in the souls of each of us, no matter what age we are. We want to know what our dad thinks of us. And I find it so interesting that God the Father thought it was necessary to go out of his way to communicate the answer to this question. Before it was even asked, the Father communicated to his son, you are my son, and I want you to know what I think about you. With you, I'm pleased. He doesn't just say that. He says, with you, I'm well pleased. This phrase, well pleased, it's a cool Greek word, and I love studying the Greek language, but yadokio, yadokio. See, this word means more than God saying, hey, you're my son, and, you know, good catch, buddy. You're my son, hey, way to go, slap on the butt. You're my son, and, you know, you're doing it good. I don't know, it's the father actually communicating the best of his ability, what his inner disposition is when he sees his son. It's a father making sure to say, son, I want you to know because there's times in your life you may wonder, you may question what I think about you. And I want you to know what I feel about you when I'm around you. It's God saying, son, when I think about you, when I see you, when I'm with you, it actually brings me deep and profound pleasure. I'm well pleased in you. Did you know that when God thinks about you, when he thinks about us, that he is actually pleased with us? He's pleased. He's not disappointed, annoyed, or angry. He's not just pleased with you on your good days, but on all days. You may wonder how. Eric, how? What about my sin? What about my past? What about my struggles? Does God affirm and is he pleased with my sin? No, 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 no. That would be twisting scripture. Eh? God hates sin. <laughs> That's why he sent Jesus. He's pleased with us because we've been washed in the blood of Christ. He's pleased with us because we're growing to become more like him. He's pleased with us because we are in Christ. And I don't know about you, but in a performance-oriented world, I think I need this constant reminder to know that when God looks at me, that I'm not under his thumb, he's actually pleased. What's kind of cool is Jesus needed this same reminder. Matthew chapter 17, Jesus' baptism he goes in the water, comes out, and he hears the voice of God say, this is my son whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. But that wasn't the only time that God communicated this because in Matthew 17, near the end of Jesus' life and ministry, he goes up to a mountain to be transfigured. And let's take a look at what happens. The words of God that come to him afresh. It says this, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face, it shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up a shelter for you. One for you, Moses, Elijah. Listen, but while Peter was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them. And a voice from the cloud said, remember these words? This is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one but Jesus. I love that story. As Jesus was beginning his ministry, as baptism, he received his father's blessing. Now Jesus is nearing the end and about to face his greatest challenge yet. And in this place, he receives as a reminder once again, his father's blessing. God wanted it to be clear to Jesus and to those around him who he was, how he was doing, and what his father thought of him. And I just feel like God, our father, gave us this example, documented it to remind us not only of the way he sees his son Jesus in his earthly ministry, but the way he sees us, who we are in Christ, and maybe even gives us a little roadmap for how we can give our kids our blessing. So this morning, my message is simple. Just wanna remind you of your father's blessing. I don't know what your heavenly, or sorry, I don't know what your earthly father was like, but you have a heavenly father who sees you with eyes of love. He is proud of you. 
He's not waiting for you to mess up, to punish you, but he's actually cheering you on to become all you've been created to be. He's proud of your fight against sin and addiction. He's proud of the way that you've made it through battles that everyone else thought you wouldn't make it through. He's proud of the way that you fought and stayed faithful in your marriage, even when it was difficult. He's proud of the way you're sacrificially loving your kids and you're praying for them and you're doing all you know to do to help them become who they are called to be. He's proud of the way you're holding the line of faith and belief in his word, even in a combative and hostile culture. He's proud of the way that you showed up to church on a beautiful June 18th Sunday in Michigan. Your father, he loves you. He's pleased with you and he calls you his own. You are his child whom he loves and with you he is well pleased. 13 words that change the life of Jesus, 13 words that can change our lives. And for the dads, can I encourage you that maybe it's a pretty good roadmap for us to apply those 13 words into the lives of our kids. I believe as we do, as we learn and live in a father's blessing, that we will do so with great joy and strength and walking into all God has called us to. Amen. Can I pray for you? Lord, we love you. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way, Father God, that in Christ you've blessed us. What a joy it is to know that we have nothing to prove, that we can come to you, Father God, just as we are, that you love us, Lord, all of us, our idiosyncrasies, the differences, the things that make us who we are, that you're proud of us. I know, Lord, that you're just and you're holy and you have a righteous requirement, but I'm so grateful that Jesus has fulfilled that and we can live and walk in your love. I just pray today, Lord, for your kids. I pray today on Father's Day that, yeah, we'd be reminded of how great you are, but I ask you, Lord, to just refresh us to know how much you love us. I thank you, Lord, for each dad that's in this room. I thank you, Lord, for the way that their hearts ache to love their kids, to release their kids into their God-given calling and destiny. And I just pray you would strengthen each dad in this place to extend their heavenly Father's blessing to their kids. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, listen, if you're here this morning and as we close, I want to close with one prayer. If Jesus Christ is not the Lord of your life, I don't think there's any greater decision you can make on Father's Day. No greater way to love and to know your heavenly Father than to make a decision to actually invite Jesus to be the Lord of your life, to pray a prayer of salvation. Maybe you walked in today and that's the very reason you came on this Father's Day. Maybe your father has passed and you know his wish for you was just to be a follower of Jesus. Well, today I want to invite you as we close service to pray this prayer with me to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Everything we've talked about today, it starts with that decision. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here this morning, no one's looking around, and Jesus is not the Lord of your life, then I want to lead you in a simple prayer, a prayer of salvation to change that this morning. So if that's you this morning, you want to pray with me as we close service, you can do it right in your seat. I already see a few hands going up, but would you lift your hand up high? Say, Eric, that's me today. I want to pray a prayer of salvation. I want to surrender my life to Jesus. I want to receive his forgiveness and love. I want to know the Heavenly Father like you've been talking about. Maybe you're watching online. Would you lift your hand right where you're at, in your living room, in your bedroom, in your car? See a few hands up. Why don't church family with those with their hands raised and those that don't, let's all say this prayer together inviting Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And I believe something powerful, supernatural will take place as you receive salvation. Let's all say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying in my place. Right now, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. And from this day forward, I choose to follow you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen.